Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics, back with Pint Size Table Runner. This time it's January, the very last in the series. We started this in January of 22, where we kicked off the February project. We were always presenting the runners to you the, the month before, so you had time to receive your kit and make your kit to display that for the whole month coming up. And I cannot believe we're on the very last of it all. And I hope you are enjoying this series. Each of them we put our whole heart into. Um, I spend days, sometimes weeks, choosing the right fabric, the design, sometimes drawing those things myself, sometimes other team members. But the whole idea is we bring it our whole heart. So if you've been with us this whole time, thank you so much. Be sure to subscribe, let your friends know, your quilt guild know. Um, these aren't just kits to us. Um, they are our, our gift to you of creation, fun, joy, uh, beauty, relaxation, all of those wonderful words. Pint sized table runner for January, of course, in North Idaho. It snows and it snows plenty, especially in January. And I think it is absolutely endearing when you're driving down the road and you see those snowmen in various yards. And that's why I could not resist to add our snowman who's all bundled up with his hat, scarf, mittens, and we have our wonderful trees. We have some fun elements I wanna call your attention to. Last month, we had the rhinestones. We got to decorate the Christmas tree. This time, we have some buttons on our snowman's belly. Those are some nice, beautiful black buttons. So get four of those in your kit. Kits, of course, are available. This is, I think, Crystal Lane. I believe that's the name of this, Bunny Hill Designs. Mode of fabric, obviously preeminent premier fabric. I love that. Backings included limited kits as always. And be sure to grab those other kits. I see them selling very quickly as people want to complete the series, especially now that they know the series is going to be completed. Be sure to grab your kit so you can have one for all 12 months. Pattern is free for a very limited time from timer release, generally about three or four months, and then we'll be turning that into a paid pattern. So if you wanna sew from home, by all means download that and get busy picking your fabrics and get sewing and share your project with us. We'd love to see it. The other things I wanna point out to you, we chose some flannel for our snowman on this, so he'd be warm and cozy, just kind of a little bit softer to the touch. Some French knots for the eyes. I'll be touching on that toward the very end. Some hand embroidery, and if you don't want anything to do with that hand embroidery, you can just draw those eyes on with a permanent marker and you don't even have to worry about that hand embroidery. Out here, these are some wool felt snowflakes that we literally cut here by hand with a die cutter. It's a very uh, time intensive thing. So this kit's just a few dollars more than the previous kits because of the buttons, because of the, uh, we have to create those <laughs> with a die cut by hand. Um, and of course the embroidery floss. So let's kick this off. We have four blocks, and this time really the blocks are all the same. So that's kind of nice. Sometimes we've been alternating that, two of alike, sometimes uh, all different, and now this time all the same. So as we examine our cute little block here, we have half square triangles, and we have some flying geese. Those are things we have touched along the way, but I wanna take, take you a kind of refresh uh, you on that and it's a little bit different with this flying geese because of the two different colors set into the flying geese unit of our block each time. So there's a little bit of a different technique. We'll still be touching on the ultimate flying geese for its trim tool functions. I'll take you there. Hey, if you're just joining, uh, maybe this is the first time you've seen a shabby video. Again, welcome. We're thrilled you're here. Be sure to go back and check out those tutorials, pick up the kits as I mentioned, and many, many more tutorials for you to just be able to dive deep into the world of quilting and a lot of DIY as well. Um, so let's just bring out, of course, the block is broken down. I always like you to see kind of those elements. What do we do? And then I'll take you through, how do we create those sections? So that's kind of how that's broken out. I'm gonna start off with those half square triangles. You have two options. If you've watched the series, you know what I'm about to say. You can make traditional half square triangles or use star singles. 
you will be picking up the one and a half inch in this case. If you want to be able to make all of these half square triangle units eight at a time with near perfection, that is your go-to product for the half square triangles. But if you're like, no, I don't want to buy another product, let me show you how we do make those. We like to upsize those just a touch. So we're having you cut two and a half inch squares. You'll layer those right side together. You can either draw the line and sew on either side, or in this instance, I used a seam guide from Creative Grid, laid that diagonal to diagonal, drew my line, and then sewed on that line. I'm always more accurate <laughs> sewing on a line than hoping I find that quarter inch seam allowance that sometimes I hit and sometimes I don't. Let's make sure we've got an iron heating up because we'll soon be cutting and pressing. I do full hot for this part. When we get down to the applique, of course, we'll be bringing the heat back to a medium for that um, applique. But for this function, we will just uh, cut on the diagonal and press toward the dark. Repeat that. So if you take this approach, you'll now need to, of course, trim off your dog ears, but you'll need to square this up now to two because going into the project, as we see our block, knowing that this is a six inch block, this needs to finish at one and a half, this needs to finish at three, and this needs to finish at one and a half. That means now this needs to be squared up to two inches. So now, you know, it's kind of like, where do I put this ruler to get that accomplished? So it's just a little bit of gymnastics to do that. That's why I love to use the star singles. I make eight at a time instead of two, there is no upsizing and there's also no trimming needed. So you will um, simply layer the two fabrics right side together. The paper tells us what size to cut our fabrics to. In this instance, it says five, although we really like to cut our fabrics a little bit bigger. You have enough fabric in your kit to also upsize. That way you're seeing your fabrics all the way around the perimeter placing that, uh, the fabrics are right side together, placing your uh, paper um, right on top. Of course, you're kind of pinning in these gaps here. Shorten that stitch length and you're always going to stitch on the dash lines, pivot on the solid lines, or the solid circle, I should say, on that circle. You'll stop needle down, pivot, come around. Once you've got that done, now you will trim and trim very carefully and accurately on that solid line. What you trim is what will be your Hasker triangle unit. So that, I do wanna call your attention to that. So I'm, I am gonna trim this up because I do want to just emphasize the importance of sewing that together to form your pinwheel. Once you have that trimmed, the best part about perforating that or having that short stitch length, besides just adding more thread to stabilize these half square triangles, is it really perforates the paper. So I'll remove that and press all of these to the dark. I'll lay them out in our pinwheel and then I'll, uh, we'll, we will sew that pinwheel together. Okay, we have those done. Let's just take a measurement check too. Remember how I said the star singles, you don't need to trim those up. They should be measuring two. And it's just a dream. I just, I don't make, uh, it's a rare occasion that I make any pinwheels or half square triangles without star singles. Sometimes it's an odd size and there is no star single. Um, in that case, um, you know, I'm back to the old school <laughs> way, but I sure appreciate that when there's a star single that fits my project. Make sure you lay your pinwheel out. I can't tell you the number of times I've sewn them together with something turned. Um, we'll place these right side together. And because we were consistent about pressing toward our dark blue, we now have a wonderful interlocking seam right there. I'm gonna pin that get that ready to go in here same 
wonderful interlocking seam. Knowing that these are now trimmed to two inches, this is all on you to sew the quarter inch seam allowance. I have the diagonal seam tape as well as a seam guide on my machine to keep me true to that quarter inch seam. If you're curious about these two products, be sure to check those out. These have absolutely helped me increase my accuracy and keep me honest when I'm uh, tending to want to sew that larger than quarter inch seam allowance. Okay, let's get started sewing. So previously we pressed toward the dark so that we would have interlocking seams. Once that's accomplished though, now pressing, the seams will press open because we want to distribute that bulk evenly. No matter what you do with the pinwheel, it's a lot of fabric coming together in the center and blocks kind of almost tend to have a slight crown. There's no getting around that really but the way you press can at least reduce um, that or at least evenly distribute that. So now seams will be pressing open throughout the remainder of the assembly of that pinwheel unit. Let's lay that out again and make sure we still have our pinwheel. Again, we could sew that like that, but that is not the quilt block we're going for. This is what we're going for placing these right side together. And of course, that intersection, that middle is what is everybody's looking for, that pinwheel. So we will pin that on this side and then in the beginning and in the end. Always pinning that area that is most important to us points coming together, seams coming together, pinning there first. This part here is where our needle needs to pass through. I'm gonna repin that one. Actually, I'm just gonna hold that one with my fingers. Again, press open. We always want to take a look. Are we happy with the pinwheel? If not, just seam rip that and do it again. Definitely have done a lot of that. There is no shame in seam ripping. I think sometimes people are like, oh, I'm at a quilt retreat. I don't want people seeing me seam rip. Seam rip. <laughs> I've done a lot of that. But when you think about the fact that we want to have these projects around for years or maybe give as a gift, we want it to represent our best abilities. And every now and again, something goes a little bit sideways and we just need to seam rip and start again. That's fine. No shame in that whatsoever. All right. That, again, that confluence, that thing doesn't want to lay exactly flat. That is our pinwheel unit. Very happy with that. Set that off to the side. When we've been doing our flying geese um, units on previously, we were referring to the finish sizes on this that are right here, trying to get some kind of a white background so you can kind of see what I'm referring to. That's kind of out the window on this one because what we're going to do, and one of the features of Creative Grids Flying Geese Tool, and they talk about this in their instructions, this is a fabulous approach to cut the one larger square and the four smaller. You've seen that if you've watched any of the pint size. In fact, I believe we did that, or maybe, I uh, can't remember which month it was, but we covered this. Sometimes though, because of either you've got two different colors in the corner, or maybe you've got scraps, maybe you don't have a square, 
big enough to accommodate that cut one. In this instance, because we know this unit finish needs to be one and a half by three, this is what, if you were going to take a traditional approach to making flying geese, this is what you'd be using. Again, out the window for us because we have two separate corners. So what are we doing? This is a function. The trim functions, trim one and two, are still absolutely valid. And they talk about this in their instruction. You can either prepare your flying geese units just like we learned by slightly upsizing them and still use the trim one, trim two functions. That's exactly what we're going to do. If you don't want to do that, you can just take the traditional approach of the rectangle. So one draw, uh, so one on and flip, and the other on and flip. I I like to trim up. I like to square up. So our instructions are upsizing. You have enough fabric in your kit to do that. So what we have here is our rectangle, and. This is what we're going to be creating here. So if you kind of look at what we're about to do, we're putting this in this corner and we're gonna put this in this corner. We've made it bigger and we're gonna use this tool to trim it up or you use your own ruler from home to trim it up. Either way, the fact that we get to trim up is awesome. We wanna go into this with trimmed up blocks, absolutely. So let's just sew that together. It does not matter whether you sew left on or the right on, doesn't matter. Because you can see when this is sewn in, you don't even see the overlap at the top here. So it's, it's, it doesn't matter which one goes on first. I'll just put this one on and let's sew that. I've just drawn the line from corner to corner. Press to the outside, and then we will trim the excess. Another product I want to introduce you to, some people don't like drawing that line, sewing on the line, pressing to the outside, lifting it up and trimming. They don't like that step. For that reason, um, Creative Grid created something called the Corner Clipper, and I'll show you that real quick. I had just, as a matter of habit, drawn the line and would place this here. What this would do, if you use the corner clipper, I'm just going to erase that line, knowing that this is the part that's going to be trimmed away, right? We're going to sew on the line, press to the outside, this gets discarded. I'm going, to, I'm going to trim that. I'm going to get rid of that line so that this is in lieu of drawing the line and then having to trim later. What you would do is place the square exactly stacked on top of that rectangle. The corner clipper is, notice how it has this amazing guidance, diagonal to diagonal, lines along the side. Notice it says two and a half. These were two and a half inch squares. It's confirming what we've already done. And um, I'm just going to draw this here, just to remind myself, that part's being discarded. It helps me to go, yeah, I'm doing this right. <laughs> You would trim now and sew. So I just wanted to throw that out there as an option. If you're like, I don't like that, that's confusing. Just keep drawing the line and sewing that on as I had already drawn that out of habit. But I do want to always introduce you to other tools so you're aware of them being an option to you. Okay, so now we have this oversized unit. Your instructions will have you um, specifically saying what size that needs to be trimmed down to. So those, you can absolutely refer to that if you're going to be using your own ruler to do that. In our instance, because we know this finished half square unit, um, excuse me, 
flying geese unit is one and a half by three. We are going to use this guide for one reason only right here. That's to figure out we are letter C, A, B, C. This tool makes a variety of flying geese sizes from half inch by one all the way up to four by eight. It's based on the finished size. So we would be using the um, letter C. Why that's important is now when we come over to trim one and over here on trim two, we're always going to be using the lines for letter C. That's the only reason we even refer to the instructions on the left side of that. All right. Now we will letter C right there. Pop that right into that slot. You'll have the ability to trim up one time, two times. So the trim one function will get you the right side and the top. Continue to rotate the mat through. Make some space, I guess. <laughs> and then we'll drop trim two right down into that slot. Now we have all kinds of confirmation. The V, this dash line, this dash line. We trim once, we trim twice. Now we have a perfect flying geese unit going into our final assembly. That's what that's about. Every time that, and you've heard me say this, it sounds like a broken record by now. Every time that I can square up a, an element going into a block, the block always comes out better. I mean, every time. So it's a lovely option. Not every time is it available, but when it is, let's always take advantage of that. So that's how you're going to create your flying geese units. And then of course, as you saw us do, we assembled our top row. We pressed our seams open to evenly distribute the bulk. Of course, we have our middle row where we have our flying geese units. And you can sew on this side pressing those seams open, and then of course your bottom row. And then once all of that's done, all seams are gonna be pressed open just like that. Okay, patchwork, four of those, lots of piecing. I should have touched on it in the very beginning, but you know those elements that just help you be more successful with patchwork. Um, sizing, the needles, the blade um, in the rotary cutter, the fresh blade, uh, the fresh needle in the sewing machine, and of course the seam guide. Whatever that is, we just need to get some good solid four patchwork blocks sewn together. There is no sashing on this one. So everything together and now you're off to the applique. So I'm going to clean up just a touch and then we're going to move right into the applique and we'll touch on that little bit of hand embroidery for the French knots on our snowman. Okay, now we're moving into the applique portion of Pint Size Table Runner for January. If you are going to be downloading this, um, the reverse for fusible applique will be something you'll need because you'll need to cut and trace your own elements. If you're getting the kit, none of that will matter to you and you'll have the assembly diagram only because that's the only thing you need. Everything is already cut for you. Pre-fused, laser cut, you're like, yes, no cutting and no tracing. That's why I buy kits from Shabby, and you're right. But if you're just now seeing one of these tutorials for the first time, I want to show you this. Again, if you're downloading that, it'll this will be in two pages. You'll have some registration marks. Line that up, tape it together in your kit or, or the paid pattern if it's mailed to you. This will be in a single page. It'll, uh, you don't have to worry about um, that being in multiple pages. Uh, the numbers represent what piece will go down first, and then the dashed lines are letting you know that piece lies behind another. So looking here at this tree trunk on uh, number one, that piece went down, and then piece two went on top, and then you can see that trunk kind of extends underneath that tree. So that helps you orient. I just did the simplest things onto the background fabric um, so that we can focus more on the snowman, which has a lot more elements to it. So the, these are easy, right? Not even have to really use necessarily an applique diagram. But 
for the snowman, we love bringing that onto the background as an individual unit, right? Not pieces one by one like I did back in the day. Bring that heat back to a medium. You never want to be using any fusible product on a full hot linen setting. Bring that back down to a medium. And the first thing you want to do anytime you're going to be using the process of the of a light box, this is a wafer one, maybe you've got one at home. You'll have the assembly diagram next. And then last, what will be coming on is an applique fusing mat. This is the magic. These are the three elements that make it possible to pre-assemble units. You could pre-assemble the trees, pre-assemble the snowman. So you're bringing them onto the background just as we have through the whole series as units, assembled units. It helps that registration be just perfect. Before I kind of uh, put that mat on top, I like to lay my pieces out, making sure I have everything I need. Just punch those out of what you'll be getting in your kit. To release that fusible webbing, just give a good pinch and that will release. And now you can see that shine on the back and that of course is our snowman. He's out of this really nice cozy thick flannel. Um, so you're not seeing the background come through and it gives him a little bit more lift and dimension off the background, which I couldn't resist that. Okay, so our first piece going down for the snowman, as we look at him, these trees were one, two, three, and four. The lowest piece on here is piece five, and that's the snowman's body, followed by his hat, pom-pom, looks like his brim, his nose, his hands, and then the scarf pieces. So we will follow that sequence, laying those pieces out. The mat goes on top. You wanna to be very near your pressing surface. We can never press, um, iron down onto the wafer light box. It is not heat tolerant. So we'll lay this down. And I sure glad I have that light box because with the thickness of that flannel, it can be very difficult to see the other shapes. So I'm, I'm happy for that. And now I'm just going to follow that number sequence. Some people like to take a photograph of the diagram. So they're not, if they're like, oh, I can't see through that to see where my next shape goes, go ahead and take a photo of your diagram and you can just refer to that at this step to know which piece should be laying down next. I have definitely found that to be helpful. Let's bring this over very carefully. Double check. Make sure you mean it. <laughs> okay. And straight down. And then we'll just let that hold there. Good five, six seconds. Everything's merging together. I just, I'm still fascinated by the technology. I think it's so cool. And the gypsy quilter who makes the Applefuse mat has said that, see, this has a tackiness to it, and I love that. Um, we'll put the snowflakes down, by the way, a little bit separately, and they're also fusible, by the way. We drew this snowflake and had a die built, and we have to crank these through by hand. So you're getting a great value in your kit, but I could not resist adding some live snowflakes kind of swirling through the forest, which we see plenty of in North Idaho. You're going to let that cool down. And now let's, while that's cooling, let's talk about the little bit of a French knot. Um, embroidery floss, the Richard Hemming size four needles. They're just a few dollars for a pack. One of these is gonna last you for a long, long time. Get two strands of the embroidery floss and you'll just knot that, um, thread that needle and then go ahead and knot that at the end. If you are going to take the embroidery approach, I'd love to encourage you to go ahead and um, you could even draw those eyes on with a micron pen. Let me see if I've got a permanent pen. 
I don't have a permanent here, but I would recommend that before you even iron this down to the background of your project, look at that, is that amazing? We have one assembled unit, it's extraordinary. <laughs> I, I, I'm just amazed by the technology, I love that. If I lay this down here now, and this is why I'd use the permanent marker, because if I use a micron pen, the moment I iron that to my background, the lines are gone. But you get the idea. Let's just pretend this is a permanent marker. Just draw those on. And now I've got my reference point. Now, I can see each of those is right beneath that kind of darker square. So I'm gonna iron this down to my background. I know those are going to disappear, but I'll re just redraw those, remembering where they were. But this is where I can bring this back to the diagram, the, uh, assembly diagram now, placing him into position. I'd place the trees into position. I already did that just to save us some time. And now we go iron everything together. Isn't that a cool process? The stems, um, not the stems, but the two trunks on the outermost uh, Christmas trees, pine trees, will be right into your seam allowance. So you're gonna take that trunk all the way to the edge of that background. And we show you that here, just to help you understand that it will be merged into that. So now everything is down. Um, by all means, that's where the thread set comes into play. Just some beautiful colors here. I think they're just so pretty to just kind of capture the essence of this. And of course we have these colors as well. Be sure to pick up that thread set, also limited. That's where the super nonstick size 8012 needle comes into play. And that I love that because it's really meant to go through fusible webbing and just with very little friction, I love that. So we said we were gonna draw those back on. I'll do that and we're gonna dive right into those French knots. We of course have our needle is threaded with two strands of the embroidery floss. Or if you're like, I don't do that hand embroidery. Okay, I, I respect that. Um, use your permanent marker and just draw those on and you're done. For us that will say, you know what, I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna give it a try. We'll come up from underneath right through that circle. Embroidery floss will come to the left. Needle is horizontal. Let's wrap around that. The more wraps you add, the bigger that knot uh, will end up being. Um, two knots is probably going to do the trick for us. We don't, it's, he's a little guy, right? So let me show that to you again. That kind of fell off the needle. Needles in front, wrap around once, twice. I should not be doing this with my light box beneath me, but I'll just make sure I don't poke that. Now I'm trapping this and letting go only at the very, very end. That's your French knot. Now, to travel to the other, I like to go very shallow. So I'm behind, not coming to the front. Double check that. Yep. And now I'm gonna travel over to the other side. And then again, we're gonna come up. If you are um, going to take the approach of doing the hand embroidery, you just wanna make sure if you are using that permanent marker that your embroidery floss is completely covering that mark. That's why you really almost only need a little bit of a, of a dot. It doesn't even need to be the full size of the eye. It's just a dot to say, do the stitch here. So you don't need to get too bold with that marker. And there is our other Hi, that's it. Very straightforward, so cute. And then of course to tie off, we're going very shallow in the back. You're basically between the background and the applique. You just always wanna make sure that you didn't actually inadvertently come to the front. Obviously you would see that with the black embroidery floss. And I like to tie off two, two times. Once that's done, then I am just going to, I wanna put those 
snowflakes on. We'll put that out of the way. And I want to just put our snowflakes down and we are going to be ready. And now I'm just going to, I'm just going to position that. I could absolutely bring out the diagram again and have them exactly positioned, but you know, notice they don't even have a number. You kind of just go for that. What I do want to say about the, the snowflakes and kind of why I save them to the end, they're delicate. Uh, they are a, a wool felt component. Um, I like to cover them up with another piece of just anything white as I iron them down. We just don't want any discoloration. Of course, you want your beautiful, crisp, clean, white snowflakes. And then you can come back and stitch those down. I believe for our snowflakes, you can see we kind of just went right down each of the spokes of that, I guess you'd call it. And then we did kind of that uh, stitching just around the center of that, just to kind of accentuate the beautiful middle. And now your applique is complete. Of course, you're doing that for both ends. So let's see our applique. Oh my gosh, this is adorable. So cute. Of course, appliqueing both ends. You'd be, of course, doing all that before you use your beautiful thread set to stitch everything down. The details on the snowflakes are stitching right down the spokes. Of course, uh, stitching the applique to the um, pieced center piece off to the quilters. Bethany did some stitching here and then just some diagonal lines in our applique background and then time for binding. I cannot believe the series is complete. Um, I've had a blast. At times I've been absolutely like, where do I go? What's my theme? And somehow it just seemed to come together. And so I hope you've enjoyed this. Pick up those kits, any thread sets you might need. Subscribe, share the good news of Shabby. Bless you and I can't wait to see you on another Shabby Fabrics video.